Hey guys, welcome to part two of our V-Ray tutorial. And again, this is featuring our dear friend, Chris Wall. And uh, some of you may know him as your history GA, but he's doing us uh, a mighty service, diving really deep into the content. And it's really helpful. So as you're watching this video, I'm gonna be floating around the studio space so you can flag me down if you need help with anything. Um, remember, this is the channel page. If you've not been keeping up with the videos, uh, please be sure to watch all of them. You're going to need this content for class. Um, all of it is organized so nicely with individual commands. This is your project three playlist right here. Uh, this video that is being recorded right now is going to go right here. So be sure to watch them because look, only 49 viewers. Only 49. I know not everyone has been able to dive into this yet. I can see these live counts. So it's really important that you watch. So be sure to keep doing so, and I'm going to be around to answer any questions. Thanks, guys. Without further ado, here is Chris. Okay, so in the last part, we looked at uh, how to use dome lights, um, scatter, and how to apply uh, basic textures. Um, in this part, we'll look a little bit more at how to apply textures and a few different ways of uh, creating light using V-Ray and um, maybe a few other things. So I have this file here. I got it from uh, Sketchfab. This isn't my file, but um, it's created by this guy. I've stripped the materials off so we can kind of go through it together and see how we can use glass, um, different tiles, um, and maybe we'll use a scatter again and start uh, looking at vegetation. So first thing, uh, let's do the dome light. Yeah, let's drop this in. Okay, and we'll go back to Chaos Cosmos. HDRIs. And then let's just use um, Day 08 again. Uh, so again, we'll copy it, go to our dome light, uh, paste it into the box, check the box, and then change this value to 0 0.015. Since we're in a new file, we'll have to set back up our um, kind of uh, preferences in the asset editor. Uh, quality is basically um, another way that the V-Ray will um, kind of interpret the resolution of the image. Denoise are on. And then render output, let's set it back to 2400. And maybe we'll do um, a 17 by 11 again. Also, um, in this tutorial, let's uh, look at using material override a little bit later. So let's go ahead and see how this is looking. Uh, okay, the lighting looks pretty good for now. Um, so let's start messing around with adding materials to this. So maybe the first thing we want to do is look at this glass. So we can go to our layers, select all um, objects, and I'll select all the glass, uh, all the objects under the glass layer. We can go to V-Ray. Chaos Cosmos, 
and then we can go to materials, down to glass. And then uh, there's a lot of glass, um, but crystal seems to work um, pretty good. So we'll just import that. Go back to our asset editor. Now the, so the material is pulled up and under the uh, materials tab. What we can do is apply to our glass layer. Okay, so it looks like it hasn't changed um, the objects under our glass layer. Uh, that's probably because these are these are meshes and not uh, polyfaces. So if we do mesh to NURB and then delete all of these, um, now we should have NURB surfaces. Let's maybe try uh, reapplying the material. Okay, so now we have uh, kind of a crystal glass that's appearing. Um, let's give it a second to kind of Yeah, so that looks pretty good. Um, so an important thing to do um, if you're using glass is sometimes uh, if it's a single surface, it won't look quite right. Um, so we can select all the objects ISO, which will just isolate these. Um, surfaces on this layer, and then let's do offset, and then set our distance to a quarter of an inch. So this will give like a thickness to the surface, um, and it'll appear um, much more natural. Let's see what these are. So typing the what command will tell you what the object is. This is a valid surface, um, but it doesn't seem to want to offset. Okay, so we can try the extrude command. Yeah, so let's do quarter of an inch. And then um, kind of delete that front face. We can select all of these now. Do um, delete input, yes. Okay, so now we're getting uh, panes of glass. We can go ahead and change this to, sorry, this, uh, this to like a, a cyan. It'll make, um, so it's like a little bit easier to keep track of what layers or what objects on your glass layer. Okay, um, so now these have been offset, these have not. So let's go ahead and select all of these, do offset. Sorry, extrude. And it's switching the layer every time I've extruded these. It's because I'm not on my glass layer. I'm on dome light. So it's um, automatically just changing that to the dome light layer. Um, so if I have my glass layer selected when I do the extrude, um, it should fix that. Okay, last ones. And then let's just go back and change object layer. Okay, so now we should have something that looks like a much more realistic glass. Um, just run it interactive and then show everything.
I'm going to stop the interactive and just run the actual rendering. Maybe why while that does its thing, um, we start um, looking at some of these other surfaces. So like we did before, we can um, add a grass texture to this. Just import this. And then apply the layer. Um, it's our ground layer. And then apply the box map. So in this case, the box map is uh, 200 centimeters. So we'll just click 200 centimeters, enter, enter, enter. You want it capped and then one. Yeah, let's try this. Okay, so our grass uh, material is not um, showing. I'm not sure why this is the case, but for some reason, um, when objects get moved across layers, applying the material to the layer itself uh, seems to have some issue. It feels like this is a new thing um, in V-Ray. It might just be a bug, but a quick workaround from this is if you select um, select our grass and then click apply to selection. This will should fix it. Yeah, so now we're getting grass. Um, so I guess the safer bet right now until uh, that's fixed is to just uh, apply to the selection. You can also apply to layers. It seems to be when um, when an object was on an existing layer and you copy it over to a new one, that can kind of happen, but um, it's easy to fix. So that's looking pretty good. Um, so a few other things we can do is we have this beam layer. So let's look at using metals. Uh, glass also so important to know is glass works most of the glass textures work a little bit differently than um, other materials in that they don't have a box map uh, see there's not a number that um, is kind of after the material name uh, so it kind of is imported at like a standard um, uh, box mapping so let's import uh, just a Maybe a silver brushed. What we can do is apply this to our beams. Then let's see what's happening in our render. Yeah, so it looks like, again, it's not applying it to the uh, object in the render view. So we'll just uh, select all the objects under beam, and then we can apply to selection. Yeah, and there we go.
and we have a bitmap for this. So let's um, select these objects, apply box mapping, and then do five centimeters. Also, it's just important to remember that um, you always want that last prompt that you're given for the channel, you want it to be on one. Because if I go here again and do apply box mapping, uh, let's just say five, say 10 centimeters this time, it'll automatically prompt, uh, it'll automatically go to box mapping two. Um, and you won't actually see that in the render, uh, in the interactive render. So you want to just make sure it's on one. OK, so this is maybe not quite. Maybe we like the um, kind of uh, reflection that's given from the metal, but uh, not quite the color. Um, so what we can do is Actually, a few different things. And uh, an easier way is we can also just make our own materials. So we can do um, material, generic. And then say we want like a really pristine white. Um, we'll apply these to the selection. Okay, but see, it's kind of like a kind of a matte surface, so we can adjust the metal, the metalness here, and it'll start to be create kind of more of a reflected uh, surface. You can also sort of alter things in uh, the reflection. But it seems metalness works the best. Um, and make sure it's on glossiness. So maybe something a little less. Okay, so what we can do is just um, let's just name this um, white metal, and let's um, select our floor, our roof, and our aliens, and then select these objects in the scene. And we can apply to selection. And let's uh, stop this for a second. Okay, we'll just give that a second. Okay, let's um I think my V-Ray isn't responding. Yeah, let's stop for a second. I'll just save this project and open it back up.
So something I did caused the rhino to crash. So let's just try again. It's probably uh, running an interactive rendering while um, while adding materials can cause some issues. Let's go ahead and continue, and then let's just open this back up. Okay, yeah, so it looks like it's applied the material. Um, let's maybe kind of uh, look at using maybe materials that aren't in the Farnsworth house, but to show maybe how wood works. Um, so we can go to V-Ray. Not just wood, but any um, kind of non-generic material, like a, a metal Uh, anything with kind of like a texture to it. So we'll open this up. Let's uh, let's stop this for now. Material, and then we can go to wood. So something with like a grain to it, or a tile, or a uh, concrete will work. Um, especially like a directional grain will work a lot differently than uh, some of the other stuff that we looked at, like uh, metals and glass. So let's import one with a, with a grain. So let's select our stair layer. And then this wood, apply to selection. By box mapping, and it's a hundred centimeters. Okay, so let's do interactive. Let's zoom in on. Okay, so you see how there's a direction to the box mapping. Um, in this case, it's kind of running um, short ways across the wood, but we probably want it to run long ways. So what we can do is with the object selected, uh, go back to this uh, texture mapping panel and we can Rotate this. Also, I believe we can click Show Mapping, and uh, we get this box. This is that um, that box box mapping that we prompted with the hundred centimeters. It's sort of like a, an invisible box that exists that um, the texture will kind of be applied to. So we can rotate this. Uh, run a render. Yeah, so it's it's fixed the um direction of the mapping on the top side of the surface, but it looks like we still have uh, it running uh, short ways on the sides. So probably the easiest thing to do to fix that would be to, okay, and that's why we have um, two different objects. We have a top layer, which looks like is what 
this box mapping is applied to, and then here is something else. So what we can do is delete those, offset, sorry, extrude. Yeah, and again, these are mesh surfaces. So first we'll have to select them and uh, mesh to, and now they should be, a uh, valid, uh, valid surface. So now we can extrude these. Now uh, let's just do two inches. And then delete that top face. And uh, since we did all that, we should probably go back to this and reapply the material. And then apply a box map. OK. Now let's just zoom in on this and run an interactive render and see how it's looking. Yeah, so again, now we have uh, the material running short ways, but if we go to our box mapping again, we can just rotate this 90 degrees. Yeah, and it's looking a lot better. Um, let's try. Extracting one of these surfaces and then. Yeah, so it looks like maybe that's just the way that this um, wood material uh, will kind of appear. Let's try maybe one more thing. I think we have, uh, okay, put these. Okay, um, it, it looks like this is just how, let's try um, how this wood will appear. Let's try scrunching this down maybe in the vertical direction. Okay, maybe we will circle back to that. Let's stop this for now. Let's um let's look at using something like 
the tiled surface. So oh, let's just go with this one. And then with our layer selected, we can apply to selection. Let's take the wood off for now and apply the and apply the same material we use for the roof and the floor to the stairs. Okay, let's run this and see how the tile is looking. We haven't applied a box mapping yet, but this should give us an idea of Okay, yeah, so it's way, way out of scale, but um, we can select these objects. Um, and then we're going to use uh, 100 centimeters for our box mapping. Yeah, just because of the scale of this, um, we'll have to give it a little bit longer. Also, um, this is kind of a very different scale than the, the tiles that are on the patio at the Farnsworth house. So we can just kind of guess. Um, Maybe we don't want this to be kind of the original um, box mapping of the material, but we can do maybe maybe four times larger than what it is. So let's do 400 centimeters and then make sure it's on channel one. Yeah, this is looking um, more like what's at the Farnsworth house. Okay, so let's select these kind of final objects that don't have that metal material on it. And then um, apply. Okay, uh, it's looking pretty good. Let's um, maybe add a few assets to the scene. So let's make this a lot larger. Let's go to our V-Ray, create a new sublayer. Let's call this one person. And this one vegetation. Again, we'll just go to our Chaos Cosmos. Go down to um, 3D models, people. 
Let's do someone walking. I'll just pick this guy. And then we can just kind of move him with the gumball tool. That looks pretty good. And then we'll do, uh, we'll go back, Chaos Cosmos, um, Vegetation. And let's just pick a, uh, a tree. Nothing too big. Some of these trees are massive. Um, so the nice thing is if you do choose to get a Chaos Cosmos license, there are tons and tons of uh, assets to use. So I, I think it's worth the money. Okay, so we'll drop that in. So same as we did before, um, Let's make a layer called scatter. And rather than um, kind of scatter across this large surface, maybe we just um, kind of choose a portion of it to scatter. So the way we do that is Of this, um, so we'll kind of make something to cut the surface. Yeah, so this is a mesh, so we'll want to um, mesh to NURB. The reason this is a mesh is because I downloaded it from um, from uh, Sketchfab. So a lot of these files will be mesh files, which don't work um, super great in Rhino. Um, generally, they'll come in fine, but uh, you get mesh surfaces, which are not ideal to work with. And the way you know this is um, before this was a mesh, now it's a valid polyface. And then we'll split this. Actually, because this is, so if we try to split this, okay, so it worked just fine. Um, so let's grab this. Let's take this surface that we split off, apply it to the scatter. Now let's go back and just grab a few things. Maybe we want, um, Maybe we want some grass. And we also want some, um, maybe some larger uh, grass files um, so it's not so kind of uniform. So we can drop this in also. Oh, those are tiny. Um, Let's delete these for now. Uh, maybe something more like this. Okay, and then um, let's do Maybe just something so you get the idea of how this works. Um, something like this. Okay, so just like before, we'll do um, render elements. Uh, sorry, geometries scatter. We'll apply to selection. So now we have a scatter plane on this, but we still need to go to scatter. Open this box. And then um, add guess. 
So now since we have um, multiple different assets being scattered, um, we can adjust the kind of probability. So we probably want the grass to be the most common, but then uh, stuff like this, um, this Everlast, we can set this probability much lower. And uh, probably set this lower as well. And then up the density of these. Okay, so let's just set up kind of a Let's try this. Yeah, so as you see, it seems to be completely overrun by the uh, the larger grass file. So um, it's probably also because we did lower the probability of this, but because it's a much larger asset than the other ones, um, you can probably lower this way more. Just something like that. Um, stop this and then Okay, still way, way too many of these. Um, we really want it to be something that's kind of sparse. Um, so let's set it to a really small number. It's also in relation to the other numbers that we have set. So if this was like 100, um, Uh, it'll bump down the probabilities of these other things. Also, um, what we can do is adjust the scale. So it'll basically um, kind of provide, if, if number one is the actual size of the object, it'll give a range that this object can kind of uh, randomly generate at. So we can let me stop this for a second. So we can have a more variety of the um, of the scale of these objects that are getting scattered. Mm, let's give this. A
Okay. Um, I'm going to set up this view again. So now we're not getting any of those, but um, it's because I've set it to such a small number. Let's go back to, maybe we just set this to one. Since we've left this to 100, we can set these to one. So basically for every 100 grasses that are, uh, Bermuda grass that I put in, um, we'll get one of the Everlast. And then we can also, while we're at it, so when working with scatters, it can really um, kind of bog down the computer. Again, that looks maybe like we're still getting too many. Um, so maybe we want something like 0. 0.2. Let's go ahead and kind of change these ranges so that it can Okay, we'll give this a second. Okay. So yeah, when working with scatter, it can really kind of overwhelm the computer. Um, but let's try to just do this quickly. And then we'll just turn the scatter layer off to show a couple more things in V-Ray. So we'll run this for a second. It is running a bit slower today than it normally does. Um, I probably need to update to the newest version of V-Ray. Yeah, so now we're getting these kind of things. It's still probably more than we want. Um, I think we want it pretty sparse, but it's looking it's looking all right. So earlier we talked about this kind of line off in the distance. Um,
another way to fix that is to let's go here and actually i don't want to crash the file but if we maybe we can just move the film light down Let's try this again. And while I'm here, let's just go ahead and take out the... the um, Everlast grass, because it's kind of throwing it off. Or maybe just set it really small. So a useful thing to do if you're um, doing renderings would be to go to File, um, Properties, and then go to Mouse. And then uh, under Middle Mouse button, uh, select Run This Macro. I think to default, it'll be... Uh, I can't remember what it is from default, but um, go ahead and type in this. Uh, it's underscore zoom selected. Click OK. So that way, when you're setting up uh, kind of views, um, you can select an object and mouse click, and it'll lock onto that object, and it'll make it a little easier to set up the kind of view that you like um, based on an object in the scene. So another important thing to maybe talk about is um, let's select this. So our uh, lens length. So earlier we looked at kind of using two point perspective. Um, let's go ahead and select this. So let's run this as an interactive render. Yeah, so now we're in two-point perspective, but um, we're not getting much uh, kind of like of a fisheye effect. Um, and that's affected by this this lens length. If we drop this down to something really small, like a 20. Um, now as we kind of zoom in on this, it'll be...
kind of providing a very different effect. Um, I think a good kind of medium uh, to do, so if we went to something like 50, it's kind of like a standard, uh, just not even two point perspective, because by default in perspective here, it's gonna be set to 50. Um, but if we do something like uh, like 30 maybe, we kind of get something in between the two. It sort of um, is providing uh, a different level of depth to the image. If we go back to 50. Uh, yeah, it's it's seems a little bit more flat. Okay, so for now, let's turn off our scatter. So we can work on some stuff on the inside because uh, it seems to be really slowing down our file. Yeah, and also when you're in two point, uh, as you start to do these kind of uh, different aerial angles, you'll see it's it's stretching the object. So uh, it's good for maybe more perspective views, but um, it causes this kind of distortion uh, to keep these uh, kind of verticals parallel to one another. So we'll go back to perspective for now. Um, let's do, Let's try to do some uh, kind of renderings from the inside um, and see how that might look. So uh, let's turn off the roof just to make it easy to get to the inside of this. Um, select this. And let's just go ahead and just use the same guy. Let's move him up. Yeah. There are a couple of different ways to create um, kind of an interior lighting. Let's see what it looks so. For instance, if I put this roof layer back on, come into here, let's see how this looks as a. So it's going to be pretty dark because we don't have. Any lighting on the inside, we're basically relying on all the um, kind of dome light lighting. Uh, so probably the there's a few different ways you can do this. You could do um, you could basically make um, a new sub layer. Let's call it lights. So you could kind of like lie basically. Um, what you could do is kind of make a model that is for a specific rendered view. So we could take these objects and hide them. Let's hide this. Because we know we kind of want this on this for a second. OK, um, but say we know we kind of set up this view that we want. Say it's maybe kind of like from here. Um, and let's go ahead and just save this. So what we can do is use uh, some of these other lighting tools that we have. Um, I like to use the um, rectangle light. Sorry, let's use 
directional light. And let's just drop it in like this. If we go to V-Ray, let's start a, let's go back to this and then uh, kind of see what this was looking like. Okay, so it's a little bit better, but um, it's not quite what we're looking for. Okay, so w what I just did was move the asset while I was rendering. Um, which you definitely don't want to do. So we'll stop this, um, go ahead and save the file, close this, and then let's reopen it. No, I'll just continue. Um, it's not quite sitting on the floor, standing on the floor here. Okay, let's do start this render again. So now, since we dropped that directional light, we have a, a something that's coming up here. Um, let's delete this tangle light. So it seems to be a little bit better, but let's try playing with, um... yeah, so now it's way too much, but let's try to find a number that um, will kind of create the lighting that we're looking for. Maybe we'll just go with three for now. Okay, yeah, so earlier we talked about uh, kind of this uh, line off in the distance um, in a few different ways to maybe. Kind of fix that, but. Um, let's see. But maybe the easiest one would be to. Move all this up. And I've left the the scatter plane um, out of this because it was causing some issues with the uh, with the rendering. And then let's just uh, let's see if we can untrim the surface. So let's try this. Okay, so it's better, but um it's still not very realistic way of creating interior light. There's definitely better ways, especially using, uh, yeah, we're still getting a kind of horizon line. Uh, we'll keep messing with that. I find the easiest way is to just kind of either extend this plane uh, way off into the distance. Something like that. Or again, just to fix it in Photoshop. Um, but yeah, the, probably the best way to, to produce interior lighting is going to be using uh, assets for it. Um, 
and luckily V Ray has uh a, a a large amount of lights that we can drop into this vital. Also, let's fix this real quick. Okay. Um so what we can do is let's just grab probably don't need this anymore. Because uh, it's not quite doing what we're looking for. Um, let's show the glass layers that we took out. Um, and I didn't move them. So let's uh, grab these. Um, move. Then let's just snap it to uh, this point. OK. Um, let's grab our. kind of roof uh, layer and let's move it up uh, by a number that we can easily remember to drop it back down later. So let's do um, maybe just 100. Let's do that again. Okay, um, now what we can do is let's just isolate this. So you can type in ISO to isolate an object. Um, Let's go back to our layers. Make sure we're on the lighting layer. And then do uh, Chaos Cosmos. So let's pick kind of a, maybe a simple, Maybe just pick this kind of standard light. Uh, so let's, um, let's fix the surface. So now what we can do is just uh, import this. Let's drop it here. And then let's um, let's kind of make an array of these on the ceiling. Um, maybe something actually that won't be. There should be a uh, a kind of standard can light. Let's just use this one. We can drop that in. And then um, let's just make an array of these on the ceiling. So let's pick a kind of a point here and then type array. And then, uh, so basically array curve will take this object and then um, first we select this object and then we select the curve that we want it to array along. And now we're getting, because there's only one, uh, or because it's set to two, uh, we're just getting one on here and here. But if we do distance and do something kind of generic, like, well, way too many there. Uh, let's do uh, 50. So what it's going to do is array one of these every 50 feet. It's probably still way more than we need. Um, I believe my units are set to, let's see here. Um, Yeah, the units are set to inches, so that's why it's kind of um, kind of off. Uh, but if we want one every maybe five feet, uh, let's set it to every 60 inches. It's probably still too many. Let's do um, every 10 feet. Yeah, so that's probably better. And then we can just select these again. Um, we push them in a bit more. 
and then array again. Um, it's it's arraying them in the opposite direction. Uh, sometimes it does that. Just to try it again. Um, okay, so now we have all these objects arrayed on the roof. Um, but they aren't just the kind of 3D asset of uh, of a light. It actually will come in as... something that will produce light. So we can come to here and then um, let's just run this as a rendering. Yeah, um, because the surface is reflective, it's kind of making it appear as a kind of a green. Um, let's do, stop this for a second. It's not actually, it's just the, the way the lighting's set up, it's making this surface appear green. Um, let's show everything again. And then let's drop this down back to... Back to where it was. Um, maybe these are slightly too close. And then we'll select this. Um, sort of get this view that we want again, and then let's run this rendering. So yeah, it's very, very dark. Um, but what we can do is go to Asset Editor, uh, select our lamp, and then up the intensity multiplier. So let's try maybe four and see how that looks. Let's hide this. Let's hide this kitchen layer for now. Yeah, so it's getting better. It also might be useful to kind of use two different lighting methods in conjunction. So this is giving us kind of a a spotlight, but um, it's still pretty dark. So what we might want to do is use a directional light um, kind of coming from where the camera is. Uh, so we can go here and then do, um, let's try a, a rectangle, a rectangular light. And what we can do is just kind of draw this rectangle. The arrow is going to be where uh, pointing, you want the arrow pointing to your object in this case. Um, you can pull this up kind of here. Um, okay, and then let's run this again. Okay, so way too bright. So we just can bump this down to something more like five.
Okay, so let's let this run for a second, see how it's looking. Yeah, so I think the lighting here is is probably fine for what we're doing or what you're going to be doing. Um, you can always edit the kind of brightness of the image through Photoshop. Um, I guess another good thing to useful thing to talk about is channels. So what channels are basically doing is kind of breaking up the image into a series of uh, channels, which make it easier to kind of go back and Photoshop uh, certain things later. Um, so the alpha will generally be kind of, uh, if you're looking at like a massing of a building, it'll kind of uh, outline in black um, the object and then the sky will be like white. Uh, so that'll be easy if you want to go in and like magic wand uh, the white object. Um, you can then use that to drop in a kind of sky. Uh, Denoiser will be kind of... Um, the, it'll basically align with the, the RGB uh, color layer after this runs through. Um, but the useful ones to have are probably uh, world norms, because what this will do is kind of, um, you can use this to kind of overlay on the image. And also, let's see if diffuse is a useful one also. Um, you can overlay this on top of the image, and it creates kind of a different effect. Um, and then I like to use, I don't have it um, on right now. So maybe we talk a little bit about um, channels for a second. So the way you add channels is render elements. Um, I want to use something called material random ID. So I've added it but it won't be showing up here yet. So I have to stop because I, I had a render already running. Um, but if I run it again, Now I'm getting material random ID. So what this does is allow me to go into Photoshop and select uh, kind of like using the magic tool. Um, every object with a different material will be denoted uh, a color. So then I can go back in and um, say I wanted to add a different sky to the background. I could really easily do that uh, using this because then I can just um, kind of magic wand these uh, windows. Uh, same with the floor, or if I um, wanted to overlay material onto the curtains here. Yeah, so this should be kind of... Yeah, it's looking it's looking all right. Um I guess these are less about like the composition of an image than um kind of the general ways that you would set up a, a kind of scene like this. I, I wouldn't suggest doing a kind of a architectural rendering like in this kind of, from this sort of a vantage point. Um 
because it's really not showing a whole lot. Um, but maybe definitely pick a kind of a scene that really kind of expresses the project the best. Maybe try. So I think it's it's looking all right. Um, in the interest of time, maybe we just show one more thing. Um, so I talked earlier about uh, material override. Uh, I think this is really useful thing to use, um, especially if you're trying to kind of pick a, a lighting, uh, like a dome light that you like. Um, what it'll do is basically override all the materials in the scene. Um, and for us, we probably, you can basically just set it to, to, uh, to like a generic white color, but, um, I like to just make a material, um, make it white and then kind of add a bit of glossiness to it. You do this with any material. Um, material override, basically, you just import any material. I could make the whole object kind of render out in grass if we wanted. I don't know why you would want to do that, but um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, so you see how material override's working. It's basically uh, kind of setting one material for every single thing in the scene. Um, let's just change it to... The generic that I just set. But say we don't want certain things like maybe the glass to be affected by the material override. What we can do is go to our materials, go to glass or any object or any material that you wouldn't want affected, and then um, go down to the bottom. It says can be overridden uh, and deselect that box. So this is also useful, I guess, if you rather um, kind of Photoshop materials. Um, let's see. You could uh, maybe use these uh, channels to um, quickly select kind of um, regions of the image and then uh, Photoshop in kind of a material texture. Uh, and then you have more of like kind of a ambient uh, occlusion type uh, lighting uh, or a more gen a generic kind of lighting uh, condition rather than um, kind of the uh, what will happen when you don't use material override. Yeah, so maybe we stop there for now and then um, maybe we can pick up again.